we've got our development environment supercharged and the team is pumping through features. In fact, they're so fast that we'll say that between this video and the previous one that they finished the whole application. So now we need to make it live. Well, as you can guess, the two primary things that are gonna let us get this done are servers and databases. A server to host our application on that will allow users to connect to it and a database to persist, well, data. <laughs> now, in AWS, the way we create servers is through their Elastic Cloud Compute Service, also known as EC2. It's in this service that we can pick settings for our server, like operating system type, CPU power, memory levels, and more. And then all we would do is hop onto AWS and just click through those settings and then it would go and make the EC2 instance for us and give us the IP address that we can connect to, among other things. And so, by the way, and I just mentioned the word EC2 instances, you know, that's something to look out for terminology-wise. Servers created through EC2 are known as EC2 instances. So you'll see the word instance and server interchanged quite a bit. Now, quick aside, if you'd like to learn more about EC2 in depth, so with the technical nitty gritty, we have our free EC2 fundamental series. I'll link to it below the video, but it'll tell you all you need to know about EC2 to make servers and start working with them. Anyway, once this server is up, well, you can put your application on it. Now, if you're not familiar with working at, with servers at all, you know, they can be pretty intimidating. A lot of developers I know when they visualize servers, uh, they see those big server farms with racks of things and boxes and, you know, and the sheer size can scare folks. But in reality, an EC2 instance is not even a real machine. It's a virtual machine. So any servers we create are actually isolated virtual machines sharing space on AWS's real hardware. And, you know, admittedly, everything I just said there probably made it sound even more intimidating. <laughs> but look, the simplest way to think about an EC2 instance or any cloud-based server is this. It's still just a computer. It's just someone else's. In this case, it's AWS's. You're still going to log into it. You're going to set things up on it, and you can do whatever you want to it. And so you'd make this EC2 instance or server, and you'd set your application up on it pretty much just like you would on your own computer. The only thing that might get in your way is the operating system. And for that, on that topic, the best bet almost every single time uh, for modern high traffic servers is going to be Linux. And so if you don't know Linux and Bash, well, that can be quite a hurdle. But let's pretend that you provision uh, an instance and for whatever reason, it has Windows installed on it. Well, would setting up an application on it be intimidating now? No, probably not. After all, it's just Windows and pretty much anyone can use that. The only thing that, that changed is that, well, instead of making the application available over localhost, you'd need to make it available from the machine in general. Well, in the end, that's all you're doing when you provision a server and you put your code on it. All the fun tools and automation scripts just remove the manual process. But if you think of it as just another computer, it's a lot easier to wrap your head around uh, in terms of how to approach it. And so you'd install the application from your remote version control source, so in this case, GitHub. Then you'd make sure the application has all of its dependencies. After that, you'd set up a database uh, on it and point the application to it. And then you'd uh, start up the application and make sure the firewalls allow in HTTP traffic or whatever it is that you're allowing in, assuming it's a web application. Now, this is what I mean when I say that servers can be unnecessarily intimidating. Everything I just described there may sound a bit intimidating in, in context of a server, but what about on your own machine? Well, you could easily do like 90% of all of this, right? Well, again, if you think of an EC2 instance as just another machine, tackling it's not nearly as bad. But one server isn't gonna take us very far at all really. <laughs> Even if we make this first server or EC2 instance, extremely big and powerful, you know, having a database on it as well, well, they're pretty weighty. They take up a lot of compute, a lot of storage, and a lot of network throughput. Sure, it works fine for local development, 
but you're the only person accessing it more than likely when hundreds or even just thousands of requests start coming into the application, that server is going to burn up pretty fast. And so to deal with that, the next thing we want to do is separate our database from our application server. Now, on AWS, we've got two ways we can do this. The first way would be completely manual, and you would just make another EC2 instance, so another server, and you'd set the database up on there, just like, again, it's just another computer. You can probably set up MySQL on your own computer. Well, you would just do that same thing on this other EC2 instance. And once you've got the database up and live, well, you just point your application server to the database server, and boom, you'd be good to go for now. However, there is a reason that database administration is its own career and field. There is a lot to it. Patching, updating, scaling, and maintaining a database is a meaty task. So unless you have an in-house expert or team that can dedicate to this, you really want to think twice before going uh, the self-managed direction. On the other hand, AWS provides us with their relational database service, also known as RDS. And specifically, they have a very powerful database called Aurora. And you know, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> it handles all of the scaling, management, and patching for you. And it's also directly compatible with both MySQL and PostgreSQL. And so even if you're developing locally with either of those two, you can still use Aurora when you go to deploy your application. It's, in fact, it's as easy as just pointing to the Aurora's database endpoint um, instead of your MySQL one. Um, and of course, as the RDS and marketing teams love to point out, it's five times as fast as MySQL and one-tenth of the cost. And with that, here we go. Here's our first major milestone. Everything would be good to go. The users could hit your server and grab the application, and the server would interact with RDS Aurora as its database. But what happens if we start getting a spike in traffic? What if our service and our applications and the company go viral? Well, thankfully, we've got the database side managed if we've picked RDS Aurora because it's going to handle all the scaling for us. But the application server won't be able to keep up, and we'll talk about how to deal with that next.